Um, something I've heard many times over the years from different reporters is that they're often afraid to make that hotline call because they don't want to get the family into trouble, so to speak. Um, and I always just try to point out that when they're making that call, they're really, it's not really about getting families into trouble. It's about trying to intervene for that child and the family to prevent um, any future abuse or neglect. So as you can see, we've got numerous different ways we can try to help families. Um, before and we do whatever we can to keep families safely in their homes with their fam with their parents or their caregivers. Um, so there's lots of different things we can implement um, to keep them safely in their home. My name is Kara Wilcox and I am the unit manager over prevention and safety um, for Children's Division in our central office. So my staff oversee everything from the front end of home visiting and um, crisis care to working with intact families to child abuse and neglect investigations. When someone suspects child abuse and neglect and calls the hotline, do they need to know all of the answers to the questions that are asked by the hotline worker? No, they do not. Um, we ask a lot of different questions just to try to pull as much information as we can. Um, from our reporters. Um, sometimes our reporters don't really totally know what they um, actually do know, so it's useful to ask lots of questions just to see if there's anything that um, they may not have thought of that would have been important to our staff. Um, you know, reporters have to walk kind of a fine line sometimes between gathering too much information before they make that phone call um, and kind of essentially connecting their own investigations into what's going on and then, you know, uh, balancing that with just having, you know, just enough information to give our staff what they need to help um, look into those concerns. Um, so it can be really difficult, but you guys don't have to know as a reporter um, all the information. That's totally okay if you don't. Um, all you really need to know um, to make that hotline is if you have that reasonable suspicion that a child has been abused or neglected. And then when it comes to neglect, it's really helpful to know and be able to articulate how that situation is really impacting that child. What is the screening process when a person calls to report suspected abuse? Um, reporters are gonna be asked a series of questions around the who, where, what, and when, and then details around the incident. Um, they'll ask, be asked lots of questions um, just to get um, demographic information about the child and the family. Um, to help us locate them and to see if we have any prior history with that family. Um, they're going to be asked specific questions pertaining to different pathways. And so our pathways are really connected to the nature of the call and the concerns. Um, so like we'll have, we have lots of different pathways, um, for example, like untreated illness, um, sexual acts, unsupervised. Um, and so you'll be asked multiple different types of questions. Um, that are related specific to those pathways. So you may get, um, depending on how complex your situation is, you may be asked quite a few questions. And then our hotline staff use that information to make several different decisions. Um, the first being whether or not to screen in on that call as a report of abuse or neglect for us to look into. Um, if they, they do decide it meets the criteria to screen in, they will assign it to um, one of the three different tracks for investigation and assessment. Um, that's, you know, our investigations, our family assessments, and our juvenile assessments are what we call child abuse neglect reports. And so if that concern doesn't rise to the level of child abuse and neglect to classify it as an actual report, we then look to see if it meets one of several different um, what we call referral criteria. And so those referrals, we have um, preventive service referrals, non-caretaker referrals, um, non-child abuse, neglect, fatality referrals. Those don't rise to the level of actual child abuse and neglect, but there's something going on with that family that we need to look into and do something about. Um, so one of our common referral types um, is a preventive service referral. Like say we have an open case on a family. We still wanna pass that information on to that case manager in case there is anything that they do need to actually address. Um, sometimes we get referrals when, you know, say a parent's incarcerated, but the situation doesn't actually um, rise to that level of abuse and neglect of the child, but maybe they don't have an appropriate caretaker for that child while they're incarcerated. So there's different things they look at, even if it doesn't rise to the level of a, uh, of a child abuse and neglect report. Um, and then lastly, if it doesn't rise to the level of an actual CAN report or a referral, then our hotline staff are gonna just document that call. 
and um, when a call is documented, nothing gets sent out to the field to look into, but it is contained within our uh, information system so that history is still there for our staff to look at if they need to. Um, and then if we get um, three or more documented calls in a 72 hour time period, we will review all of those together to see if um, together they rise to the level of us intervening with that family. Um, so that screening criteria and that track assignment is um, are two of the main functions of the hotline and then they will assess um, and determine how quickly our field staff need to go out and make contact with those victim children and that family. And we have three different response time frames. Our emergency reports, we have to see victim children within three hours. Most of our reports fall into a 24 hour period of time. And then some of our reports like educational neglect will fall into a 72 hour time frame. So the hotline is setting that immediate response priority as well. What is the difference between an assessment and an investigation? Well, we have actually three different types of uh, reports. We have um, assessments, family assessments, juvenile assessments, and investigations. So our investigations are where there is generally a criminal component and we are required to investigate those um, types of reports with law enforcement. Um, there's often a need to collect physical evidence in those types of reports um, and in an investigation that's where we're actually making a determination whether somebody abused or neglected a child and then if we do make that determination that alleged perpetrator goes um, after potential appeal process goes on to our central registry and that is a registry of people um, that it's often used for background screening purposes for um, employers where you're working with children, like daycares, schools, um, sometimes hospitals, and things like that. Most of our reports come in as a family assessment, um, and that's where we're really just looking at the situation as a whole for that family and determining whether or not um, they have any kind of need for services um, to help prevent uh, future acts of, of abuse or neglect. Um, we're not putting people on the central registry for a family assessment. We're really just trying to figure out what's going on and to really provide some um, assistance for that family. And then we have our juvenile assessments where those are reports where a child under the age of 14 has been alleged to have committed a sexual abuse act against another child. And for those types of reports, we're also again really looking at that family, that child who's potentially having some sexual behaviors um, to see if there's anything that we need to do to help intervene to prevent those behaviors from escalating in the future. What types of services does Children's Division offer the family to help them during family assessments? So we have all sorts of different services that we can offer to families. Um, first and foremost, we can always refer families to any outside community agencies um, for any services uh, that they may need. So if they need mental health services or substance abuse services or having some problems with housing or things like that, we will make referrals to outside agencies. Um, we also have several programs within the Children's Division that we may refer families to depending on the situation that's going on. So we have what we call family-centered services cases. Um, and so if during our hotline process we um, decide that that family needs some more um, intensive intervention from us and more ongoing intervention from us, we can open a family-centered services case um, and assign that to a case manager who's, you know, really trying to work with that family, um, monitoring the situation that's going on, um, determining, doing an assessment and determining um, what kinds of services that family may need. Um, we also have uh, an intensive in-home services program. And that is a program that if a child in the home is at um, pretty imminent risk to be removed from their parents, we can get IIS in that home to really intensively work with the family um, around those issues that are going on to help prevent that child from entering care. Um, and those case managers, we contract that service out, but those case managers also are you know, looking to see what kind of services the family could benefit, as well as providing their own interventions. We also have a home visiting program. So if we have families that have kids under the age of three, we can refer to home visiting. 
Um, and that's just providing additional support to the family, linking them to additional resources in the community, um, really working with them to build their parenting skills and knowledge um, and to help model appropriate uh, parenting skills for, that, for those parents. Uh, we have a program called Crisis Care, um, and that's a program that families can utilize even on their own without Children's Division involvement. Um, if they're experiencing some sort of crisis or emergency that um, really may put that child at risk for abuse or neglect. So some scenarios where uh, crisis care might be appropriate for that family is, you know, say a parent's experiencing temporary homelessness and they don't really have any place for their children to be while they're trying to work through that and try to find um, appropriate housing so they can place their child in crisis care um, for a short period of time. It's not intended to last for a very long time, but it gives that parent kind of that break to work on whatever the problem is, that crisis is in that moment, without having to worry about who's taking care of their children. We also have our children's treatment services contract um, that we can provide diff all sorts of different types of so services to families, um, depending on what's going on. Um, some examples of those services include mental health services, parent education, parent aid services, um, domestic violence batters intervention programs, substance use treatment. So if there's no other funding source for that family, like um, if they don't have Medicaid, we can sometimes, especially more for our foster children, um, we can provide those types of services to meet whatever the need is for that family. So those are just some of the services that we can provide to families. Um, something I've heard many times over the years from different reporters is that they're often afraid to make that hotline call because they don't want to get the family into trouble, so to speak. Um, and I always just try to point out that when they're making that call, they're really, it's not really about getting families into trouble. It's about trying to intervene for that child and the family to prevent um, any future abuse or neglect. So as you can see, we've got numerous different ways we can try to help families. Um, before and we do whatever we can to keep families safely in their homes with their fam with their parents or their caregivers. Um, so there's lots of different things we can implement um, to keep them safely in their home. Um, so what I just described was just you know really some of the bigger services that we have, but there's lots of different things we can do. Um, so if you have concerns, I just always make sure that you know you take that opportunity to really try to help that family by making that call to us because um, it's really about trying to um, reduce that future risk of abuse or neglect, I mean, to figure out what's going on and how we can help. What should someone do after they've made a report of suspected child abuse or neglect and they're still interacting with the child and the family? Um, I would say just make sure that you keep checking in on that child um, to make sure that they're safe um, and that they don't have any concerns. Um, offer as much support as you can um, to them. Um, I also, I would say, you know, don't ever make a promise to a child that something is going to happen and make their situation um, different because, you know, lots of different factors may come into play and that, that may not, you may not always be able to follow through on those promises. But I think the biggest thing is just really continuing to be there as a support and a resource. And then if you have any additional um, concerns that come up, to make sure that you call back. Um, hopefully by that point, you know who that um, that report has possibly been assigned to in the county office and if you have additional concerns you can you know call them back and share that information with them so that they can make sure that they're addressing everything that, that needs to be addressed. 